It's late 14th century BCE and Mycenae is at the peak of its economic and political power. Its trade is flourishing, with networks spreading all the way to the great kingdoms of the Near East. One of its ships departed the eastern ports, stuffed with heavy cargo and moving past Cyprus en route to the Greek mainland. It is carrying goods and materials from all corners of the known world, including gold and luxury items meant for the Mycenaean royalty. Upon passing by the coast of Lucia, however, the ship is caught in a terrible storm. The Mycenaean crew are experienced and savvy sailors, but this time the sea god is their enemy and there's no escape. The ship crashes to the headland, sinking to the bottom of the sea with its crew and cargo lost, never to be found again. This is just one of the theories for an unfortunate chain of events that led to what we today know as the Oliburn shipwreck, believed to be a lost Mycenaean cargo swallowed by the sea. The shipwreck itself was discovered in 1982 by a local sponge diver and soon became an object of major excavation spanning across the following decades. According to the original dendrochronological dating, Based on the wood examination, the shipwreck was placed at the end of the 14th century BCE, as late as year 1305. The radiocarbon calibration, however, points to two decades earlier, to about 1327 BCE. Either way, late 14th century BCE was a time of Mycenaean prosperity, when the kings of Mycenae ruled over a coalition of palace centers spinning across the Greek mainland, the Aegean islands and even a foothold on the coast of Asia Minor. That the ship was indeed Mycenaean, or at least meant for the Mycenaeans, is believed to be the case based on the cargo contains, as well as ingot type characteristic for Greece of the Bronze Age. Moreover, it is determined that the ship sailed in the direction westwards from Cyprus and towards the Aegean. Thus, the starting point could have been either a Cypriot or a Near Eastern port, with the target destination being the Greek mainland, more than likely one of the Mycenaean palace centers. The cargo itself contained a great variety of goods, materials, weapons and other items, including jewelry. The biggest portion of the load consisted of raw materials, about 10 tons of copper and approximately 1 ton of tin, which alloyed together would result in about 11 tons of bronze. Copper predictably came from Cyprus, a major center of copper production and trade throughout the Late Bronze Age. 175 glass ingots were also being transported and included cobalt blue, turquoise and lavender types, all three used in the Mycenaean production of jewelry. Then there were about 150 jars which came from Canaan and a miscellaneous cargo which included logs of blackwood from Africa, ivory in the form of hippo and elephant tusks, more than a dozen hippo teeth, upper tortoise shells, murex opercula used for fragrance, ostrich eggshells, more than two dozen seashell rings, duck-shaped cosmetics boxes and unguent spoons made of ivory, beads of amber likely from the Baltics, thin glazed pottery, bronze and copper drinking cups in shapes of rams and women's heads, Cypriot pottery, Cypriot oil lamps, a trumpet, agate, carnelian, quartz, gold and glass. The cargo also included edibles, such as almonds, pine nuts, figs, olives, grapes, safflower, black cumin, sumac, coriander, pomegranates and a few grains of shard wheat and barley. A large number of weights included 120 which were of geometric shape and about 20 zoomorphic. Naturally, the ship also carried jewelry, definitely meant for someone of high importance in Mycenae. A large golden chalice which was the largest object on cargo made of gold, a gold scarab inscribed with the name of the Egyptian queen Nefertiti, 
dozen of gold pieces such as pectorals, medallions, pennants, beads and ring ingots. Various other objects of gold, electrum, silver and soapstone from Egypt. A large collection of scrap gold and silver jewelry from Canaan and a bronze female figurine with its head, neck, hands and feet covered in sheet gold. A large number of tools included sickles, awls, drill bits, a saw, a pair of thongs, shaft hole axes, chisels, a plug share, wheat stones, adzes and a folding boxwood writing tablet with ivory hinges and likely wax writing surfaces. Finally, the cargo included weapons, arrowheads, spearheads, maces, daggers, battle axes, a ceremonial Greek volcanic stone axe, scale armor from the Near East, and four swords including Mycenaean, Canaanite, and possibly Italian types. Such large and diverse cargo, more than likely sailing towards a Mycenaean palace center, would have been subsequently processed by the palatial administration. Jewelry, precious metals, minerals and other luxury items and objects would have been gifts for the Mycenaean royalty, while raw materials would have gone to the labor force for production of various needs. Also, it is possible that such important cargo ship would have been protected by a few lighter and battle-capable vessels in order to guard against possible piracy which was flourishing throughout the Mediterranean. Any loss of such ship would have been a loss of significant proportions for its owner, whether a king or a wealthy member of the ruling class. All we know is that on that grim day in the late 14th century BCE, a large treasury was lost next to the coast of Lucia. Was it attacked by the pirates? After all, the Lycians were notorious for their piracy. Or did it crash due to bad weather? Did the sailors anger Poseidon? And what were the starting point and the final destination? Was the ship sent by the Egyptian pharaoh, a Cypriot ruler or a Near Eastern monarch to his Mycenaean counterpart? Or did the Mycenaean ruling class order a big delivery to satisfy the palatial needs? What do you think? Make sure to let us know in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe. We're introducing the Super Thanks. The Super Thanks button allows you, the viewers, to show an extra gratitude to the channel and get your comments highlighted and noticed not only by myself, but other viewers as well. Underneath the video, you will see a heart with a dollar sign in it. You can enter any amount that you find suitable. Hopefully you enjoy the content. Special thanks to History with Sai, Nico, Chris Ernst, Panayotis Yanopoulos, Fred Lecky, Tim Lane, Derek Wildstar, ABC Shake, Padre91, Argiris Margaritis, Huel Sally Briggs, La Belle Olmier, Winyard Illumination and Estate Care on their continuous support. If you wish to discuss and decide on the future content, feel free to join us on Patreon. Special shout out to Romulus Augustus. This was 1XTV and we'll see you again soon.